This meeting is now own. being recorded. More in control of your own destiny and able to forge your own way with your own policies. Norman, you're, you're quite right. The thing is, I have to admit, we did not have a mandate for bringing Greece out of the euro. What we had a mandate to do was to negotiate for a kind of uh, arrangement with uh, the Eurogroup, with the European Central Bank, that would render Greece sustainable within the Eurozone. The mandate went a bit further, at least in my estimation. I think the Greek people had authorized us to pursue energetically and vigorously that negotiation to the point of saying that if we can't have a viable agreement, then we should consider getting out. The problem was that um, once you are inside the clasps of a monetary union, it is ever so hard to create the kind of public dialogue which is necessary in order to prepare people for the for what comes for what the, you know for the process of disengagement from the currency union, while at the same time not precipitating a collapse. It's a little bit like imagine if you had to prepare a population, an electorate, for a devaluation, a very large devaluation, 12 months before it takes place, through dialogue. You can understand that this is an impossibility. We don't have a, a currency which we can devalue vis-à-vis -vis the euro. We have the euro. And uh, what I keep telling people is that, uh, it, uh, in our estimation, it would have taken 12 months. But well, I think that Norman's got a point, if I may, if I may say so, Yanis, because you obviously didn't have a plan B, and that did rather weaken your negotiating argument, because the others were absolutely scared of you leaving, and yet you said, don't worry, we're not going to leave. I think, though, that just in the last couple of weeks, you yourself did start to think about a plan B, and I think you even gave some inkling of that in your interview with the New Statesman, where there was a vote in the inner cabinet in Athens after the referendum, and you were in favour of trying to prosecute a plan B, and you were outvoted. Do, do you think there's still a chance, if everything goes badly, that there may well be a plan B, and that the Grexit, which nobody wants in Greece, I, I understand that, but do you think it may still come about, even though it's something which, for which you are unprepared? Oh, absolutely, absolutely. I think that this agreement is not viable, and uh, Dr. Wolfgang Schäuble, the German finance minister, is hell-bent on uh, affecting a Brexit. So, it, it, nothing is over. But let me be very specific and very precise on this. The Prime Minister, before he became Prime Minister, and before we, were, uh, before we won the election in January, had given me the green light to come up with a Plan B. And I assembled a very able team, a small team, as it had to be, because that had to be kept completely under wraps, for obvious reasons, and we've been working since uh, the end of December, beginning of January, on creating one. But let me give you, if you are interested, some of the uh, political and the institutional impediments that uh, made it hard for us to complete the work and indeed to activate it. Uh, the work was more or less complete. We did have a plan B, but the, the, the difficulty was to go from the five people who were planning it to the 1,000 people that would have to implement it. Uh, for that, I would need, I had to, to receive another authorization, which never came. But let me give you an example. We were planning along an, a number of fronts. I'll just mention one. Uh, take the, 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 the case of um, the first few moments when the banks are shut, the ATMs don't function, and there has to be some parallel payment system by which to keep the economy going for a little while to give the population the feel that uh, the state is in control and that there is a plan. What we uh, planned to do was the, the following. There is the website of the tax office, like there is in Britain and everywhere else, where citizens, taxpayers, uh, go into the website, they use their tax file number, and they transfer through web banking uh, monies from the bank account to their tax file number so as to make payments on VAT, on income tax, uh, and so on and so forth. We were planning to um, create uh, surreptitiously 
reserve accounts attached to every tax file number without telling anyone, just to have this system uh, function uh, under wraps and at the touch of a button to allow us to give PIN numbers to tax file uh, number holders, taxpayers. So when, let, let's say, take for instance the case where the, the, the state uh, owed a million euros to some pharmaceutical company for drugs purchased uh, on behalf of the National Health Service. We could uh, immediately create a digital transfer into that reserve account of the tax file number of the pharmaceutical company and provide them with a PIN number so that they could use this as a, as a kind of parallel payment mechanism by which to transfer whichever part of, that, of those digital monies they wanted to any tax file number uh, to whom they owed money or indeed to use it in order to make payment, tax payments for the state. That would have created uh, a parallel banking system while the banks were shut as a result of the ECB's aggressive action to give us some breathing space. Uh, this was very well developed and I think it would have made a very big difference because very soon we could have extended it uh, using apps on smartphones and it would become um, a functioning and functional parallel system. And then of course this would be euro denominated but at the drop of a hat it could be converted to a new drachma. Now let me tell you, and I think this is quite a fascinating story, what difficulties I faced. The General Secretariat of Public Revenues within my ministry is controlled fully and directly by the Troika. It was not under the control of my ministry, of me as minister, it was, to control, it was controlled by Brussels. Uh, the General Secretary was, is appointed effectively through a process that is Troika controlled and the whole mechanism within. It's like inland revenue in the, in the United Kingdom being controlled by Brussels. I, can, I am sure that as, as you are hearing these words, your hair is standing. <laughs> Uh, okay, so problem number one. The General Secretariat of Information Systems, on the other hand, was controlled by me as minister. And I appointed a good friend of mine, a childhood friend of mine, who had become a professor of uh, IT at Columbia University in the States and so on. I put him there because I trusted him to develop the system. At some point, a week or so after we moved into the ministry, he calls me up and says to me, you know what, I control the machines. I control the hardware. I do not control the software. The software belongs to the Troika Control General Secretariat of for, for Public Revenues. What do we do? And so we had a meeting, just the two of us, nobody else knew. And he said, listen, if I, if I ask for permission from them to, to, to start implementing this program, then the Troika will immediately know that we are designing a parallel system. Well, I said, that's not what we won't do. We don't want to, to reveal our hand at this stage. So I authorized him, and you can't tell anyone that, this is totally between us, to hack... I'll, I'll send the others listening, yes, but they will not send it to their friends. I know, I know. I know they are. <laughs> and if they, even if they do, I will refuse, I, I'll deny I said it. So, um, the, so we, we decided to hack into my minister's own software program in order to be able to bring it all to just copy, just copy the code of the tax systems website onto a large computer in, in, in his office so that he can work, work out how to, to design and implement this uh, parallel payment system. And we were ready to, uh, to get a green line from the Prime Minister when the banks closed in order to move into the General Secretariat of Public Revenues, which is not controlled by us, but is control, controlled by Brussels, and to plug the, the, this laptop in and to energize the system. But you, so you, I'm trying to convey to you the kind of institutional uh, 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 problems that we had, institutional impediments to carrying out an independent policy for ameliorating the effects well, of having truly, our banks being closed down by the ECB. That's truly terrible, um, shocking. Could, could we just sort of, Yanis, because we've got a limited time, could we, and for the benefit of those listening, just move a bit to the present and the future? I mean, that is truly shocking, and I won't ever forget that. But can you say something, if possible, about whether you think debt relief is coming now, as suggested by the IMF, or uh, 
how do you think a decision could be made? My great worry at the moment, on behalf of my good friend Euclid Sakalotus, whom I think, by the way, you met at that dinner. Yes, I did. Yes, 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 we both. He went to my old college, Queen's College, Oxford, actually. So uh, we have a strong Indeed. bond. Yes, yes, and he's a St. Paul's boy, where George, George Osborne studied. Ah, uh, uh, yes. <laughs> Euclid, my great worry about Euclid, uh, on behalf of Euclid, is that the IMF and Dr. Shigley and the ESM are engaged in a, a game that is absolutely the opposite of straightforward. On the one hand, we're being told that the ESM will only provide this uh, much-discussed loan of more than 80 billion if the IMF is on board. The IMF is uh, coming out with debt sustainability analysis, which quite clearly stated for the record that the Greek debt is not sustainable, and according to its own rules, the IMF cannot participate in any new bailout. I mean, they've already violated their rules twice to do so. But I don't think they will do it a third time. I think they are kicking and screaming that they are not going to do it a third time. So there is a very serious uh, uh, danger here that the Greek parliament, not in my name, but in the name of the majority who voted last night, will approve the very stringent um, uh, measures, uh, reforms they call them, but they are nothing but just uh, cost-cutting exercises. Uh, without much reform, uh, ref uh, reforming going on. But anyway, that, the, that, that we will push through Parliament these prior actions that they have been called. But then, at the end of the day, the ESM and the IMF will not be able to coordinate so as to provide that huge loan. Not that I want that huge loan to be provided, for the reasons that you, David, yeah. and Norman, you, Norman, outlined before. But I think that the, the, there is a major tussle between the institutions. The ESM, the European Commission the IMF and Dr. Schäuble. Dr. Schäuble and the IMF have a common interest. They don't want this deal to go ahead. Uh, Wolfgang has quite clearly said to me he wants Brexit. He thinks that this, is, this extended pretend is uh, unacceptable. And this is the one point where we see eye to eye. <laughs> I agree with him too for completely different reasons, of course. The IMF does not want an agreement because it does not want to have to violate its charter again and to provide new loans to a country whose debt is uh, not viable. The Commission really wants this deal to go ahead. Merkel wants this deal to go ahead. So what has been happening over the last five months is now projected into the, into the uh, very short term, uh, only it is on steroids. <laughs> and that is this complete lack of coordination between the creditors. That has been very striking, I have to say, Yanis. What about France? You are on record as having said that you think this is all about France and that Mr. Schäuble is using you as a kind of pawn, basically, in a much bigger chess game with France. Now, I know Greece is certainly not in a very healthy position, but can you tell us a little bit about where you think France plays out in all of this? The French are terrified. They are terrified because then they know that uh, if they're going to uh, shrink their budget deficit to the levels that Berlin demands, the Parisian government will, will, will certainly fall. There is no way that they can politically handle the kind of austerity which is demanded of them by, uh, by Berlin. And when I say by Berlin, I mean by Berlin. I don't, I don't mean Brussels, I mean Berlin. So they are trying to buy time. This is what they've been doing now, as you know, for a couple of years. They've been trying to buy time uh, in terms of an extension of the time period during which they will have to reduce the deficit to below 3.5%, 3%, the Maastricht criteria, the stability and growth pact. At the very same time, Wolfgang Schäuble has a plan. I wrote an article today in Die Zeit in the German newspaper quite extensive and quite controversial, in which I explain what Dr. Schäuble's plan is. And this is one of the very sweet moments in one's life when I, one does not have to theorize because all I did was to convey the plan as Dr. Schäuble described it to me. And the, the way he described it to me is very simple. 
he believes that the Eurozone is not sustainable as it is. He believes that there has to be some fiscal transfers, some degree of political union. He believes that uh, for that political union to work without federation, without the legitimacy that a properly elected federal parliament can render, can um, bestow upon uh, an executive, it will have to be done in a very disciplinarian way. And he said explicitly to, to me that a Greek, exit, a Greek exit is going to equip him with sufficient bargaining power, with sufficient, sufficient um, terrorizing power in order to impose upon the French that which Paris is resisting. And, that, and what is that? A, a degree of um, a transfer of uh, uh, budget-making powers from Paris to Brussels. Well, this is really fascinating so, stuff. As, as, as Norman said, we are slightly running out of time, but we've been allowed by the controllers of Radio Omphiv to go on for another five minutes. So, Norman, shall we have two last questions, one from you and one from me? Norman. Well, I just wondered, would you... Are you in any way, I'm not sort of suggesting you should be, but I'm just interested in your view um, about the role of the ECB in this. I read there's a lot of criticism in Greece of the ECB and the feeling that the ECB had acted in a political way, whereas my own instinct would be that Mario Draghi would lean over backwards not to be political, although at times he would have to make decisions that obviously would have political effects. I think that both perspectives are completely spot on. You're right. Mario Draghi has handled himself as well as he could, and he tried to stay out of this mire, the political mire, uh, impressively. I have... I've always had, held him in high regard. I, ha I hold him in even higher regard now, having experienced him uh, over the last six months. Having said that, the European Central Bank is set up in such a way that it is so highly political. It is impossible not to be political. Don't forget that the ECB, the Central Bank of Greece, because that's what the ECB is, is the Central Bank of all of our member states. The Central Bank of Greece is a creditor of the Greek state. And therefore, it is also, once, it is the lender of last resort, supposedly, and the enforcer of fiscal austerity. Now, that violates uh, immediately the supposed uh, distinction between fiscal and monetary policy. It puts Draghi in a position where, in acting as a creditor when we came into power, he had to discipline us. He had to actually asphyxiate yeah. us sufficiently yeah. in order to yield to the demands of the creditors, while at the same time keeping our banks open. So, you know, God could not do this in a non-political way. Yes. He's going to be turning on the taps, I think. Now, there's some talk that uh, somehow you will be benefiting from uh, quantitative easing once the loans are repaid on on Monday. That's one question to you, Yanis, just in the final couple of minutes. The second question I've got to, for you is, what kind of a role are you going to be playing? Are you going to be in any political position now? Is uh, Alexis Tsipras still talking to you? Do you still have some um, in, in, interlocutor with the uh, government? And also, what do you think of the future of Mr. Tsipras? Is he going to stay around for a lot? So sorry to load you up with a fairly large number of questions for your final couple of minutes. Well, on the first question, what, they are do what the ECB is doing, it is uh, increasing ELA by 900 million in order to give a little bit more uh, liquidity through the ATMs that were very simply circumscribed up until now. The question of quantitative easing uh, is, I think, crucial. If Greece does not get into, onto the bandwagon of quantitative easing over the next few months, then that's it. There's absolutely no, no way that Greece can stay in the Eurozone. But to, for this to be meaningful, they have to have, firstly, they need to restructure the Greek debt. The idea of the German government that we will first have to successfully complete a program that cannot be completed successfully, and then we're going to have debt restructuring, effectively annuls the whole idea of quantitative easing. On the question of my relationship with Alexis, look, I have a very strong personal relationship with him. Uh, there's a good friendship there. 
uh, let me give you an example. Yesterday, I voted against him. Uh, I crossed the floor. It was very painful for me. I could see that he was very uh, upset by that. We met afterwards. He was sitting down. I was passing by him. He extended his arm uh, very warmly. I um, sort of went towards him, and we hugged and, and kissed even. So there is this. But at the same time, I, at the moment, what I'm experiencing, David and Norman, is this, uh, you know, I've become the traitor of the party. You know how it is when you cross the floor suddenly. And, and, and you cross the floor not because you've shifted, but because everybody else has shifted. They've, they've undergone a mutation. Suddenly they have adopted the language that uh, I've been countering for the last six years with them. <laughs> but now they have adopted it. And so that, I'm not sure what kind of relationship we're going to have. Up until yesterday, Alexis was very keen to say to me that he would definitely need me. She offered me another ministry only a few days ago. I said no, because I don't care about having a ministry. Uh, what I care about is a sustainable uh, Greek debt, a sustainable Greek economy. What we are doing now is, you know, to, whatever the reasons are, what the, the measures we, we introduced yesterday through Parliament will choke the Greek private sector. And a, a private sector that has already suffered so massively over the last, the last five years. Uh, I'm going to stay in Parliament. I really love being a backbencher. I have only been a backbencher for a week. It's great. <laughs> it gives me the opportunity to speak out and to write and uh, to visit the friends outside of Greece. And I hope to see you soon in London. Well, we hope that very much. That's been a very good postscript. I would just like to say thank you both to Lord Lamont and to Yanis Varoufakis. I'm sorry that there were a few technical hitches at the beginning. That was actually because our system was rather overloaded by the number of fallers. Uh, when you came here in London, uh, Yanis, in February, there were about 20. In fact, we had 84 people on the line from all over the world. <laughs> um, I, I do have to say also that you did say one or two things which were slightly sensitive um, regarding various uh, episodes when you were a minister. So I'd just like to say to everybody that none of this information that you've been hearing here uh, should be used, firstly, or to make any trades of any sort in any way, but also please do not pass this on to other people. This is a private conversation under the famous Chatham House rule, and the idea is that you hear firsthand from Yanis Varoufakis and also from Norman Lamont about their experiences, but this is not a public broadcast. This is not the BBC. So I'd like to say thank you very much for this trust and confidence. I think I'll speak both for myself and Norman Yanis to say that it's a great privilege to speak to a finance minister who may certainly have lost a temporary battle here, but nonetheless uh, remains very philosophical about it all and has a huge depth of political and economic knowledge about the Euro system that not all of your compatriots uh, on the Eurogroup do have. And so we, we very much enjoy talking to you. We're absolutely sure this won't be the last time that we have you on the line. We look forward to seeing you either in Athens or in London very soon. And so I'd like to say on behalf of David Marsh, Norman Lamont and Yanis Varoufakis, goodbye from OMPFIV and we look forward to having you tune in again before too long. So thank you very much, all of you, for listening. Thank you, Yanis. Thank you, Norma, for being part of this call. Goodbye from London. Bye. Bye, Yanis. Bye-bye. Thank you very much.